In Chapter 25, we will briefly introduce the concept of the fast breeder reactor, which can transform fertile materials to fissile materials to greatly increase the utilization of the nuclear material. First, let us review the concept of the fissile and the fertile material. For a fissile material, it is a nuclide that is capable of undergoing fission after capturing low-energy thermal neutrons, like uranium-235, plutonium-239, which are typical nuclear fuel used by the thermal neutron reactors. The phase cell material also includes the uranium-233. For the fertile material, it is a material that is not phase cell, but it can be converted into a phase cell material by irradiation in a reactor. There are two basic fertile materials, uranium-238 and thorium-232. When this, when this fertile material captures neutrons, they are converted into fissile plutonium-239 and uranium-233, respectively, after undergoing two beta decays. The most important feature of the fission process is, of course, the enormous energy release from each reaction. Another significant effect, however, is that for each neutron absorbed, in a field such as uranium-235, more than two neutrons are released. To maintain the chain reaction, only one is needed. Any extra neutrons available can thus be used to produce other phase cell material, such as plutonium-239 and uranium-233 from the fertile materials, uranium-238 and thorium-232, respectively. If losses of neutrons can be reduced enough, the possibility exists for new fuel to be generated in quantity as large or even larger than the amount consumed, a condition called breeding. There is continued interest in some level of recycling to help reduce radioactive waste and to use all fuel energy content. The ability to convert significant quantities of fertile materials into useful phase cell materials depends crucially on the magnitude of the reproduction factor eta, which is the number of neutrons produced per neutron absorbed in fuel. If mu neutrons are produced per fission, and the ratio of fission to absorption in fuel is sigma f over sigma a, then the number of neutrons per absorption can be calculated by this formula. Eta, the reproduction factor, is equal to mu times sigma f over sigma a. Then we expand sigma a as sigma f plus sigma gamma, that is fission cross-section plus the capture cross-section. Then we divide the sigma f from the denominator and also the numerator. So we get the eta is equal to mu over 1 plus alpha, in which alpha is the capture to fission ratio, sigma gamma over sigma f. The greater the reproduction factor exceeds above 2, the more likely is breeding. It means that we want this eta to be as higher as high as possible, and it should be at least 2. <laughs> this figure graphs the average number of neutrons emitted mu as a function of the energy of the neutron inducing the fission. You will see that this mu value is higher with higher neutron energy. It is found that both mu and the ratio sigma f over sigma a increase with neutron energy, and thus eta is larger for fast reactor than for thermal reactors. This table compares values of eta for the main phase cell isotopes in the two widely differing neutral energy ranges, designated as thermal and fast. Inspection of the table reveals that it is more difficult to achieve breeding with uranium-235 and plutonium-239 in a thermal reactor, because 
point zero seven and the point eleven neutrons are very likely to be lost by absorption in structural materials, moderator, and uh, fission product poisons. From this table, we can conclude that uh, the fast neutron can produce more neutrons per fission. Therefore, it is preferred to use the fast reactor to achieve the breeding. From the previous table, we conclude that uh, a fast reactor that use plutonium-239 is the most promising candidate for breeding. Liquid metal fast breeder reactor has been operated successfully throughout the world. Presently, the only two operating liquid metal fast breeder reactors in the world are at the Belovyask plant in Russia. Supplying electricity since 1981, so 560 MW E BN600 has operated more successfully than any other reactor in that country. Belovyask Unit 4, which is a larger 789 MW E BN800 model, became operational in 2016. The use of liquid sodium as coolant ensures that there is little neutral moderation in the fast reactor. Nonetheless, the sodium presents reduces the average neutron energy, thus shifting or softening the neutron spectrum to lower energy. The element sodium melts at 98 Celsius, boils at 881 Celsius, and has an excellent heat transfer property. With such a high melting point, pipes containing sodium must be heated electronically and thermally insulated to prevent freezing. The coolant becomes radioactive by neutron absorption in sodium-23, producing the sodium-24, whose half-life is 15 hours. The nuclear equation is shown here. Sodium-23 absorbed one neutron, became sodium-24. Great care must be taken to prevent contact between sodium and water or air, which would result in a serious fire accompanied by the spread of radioactivity. To avoid such an event, an intermediate heat exchanger is used in which heat is transferred from radioactive primary sodium to non-radioactive secondary sodium. Two physical arrangements of the reactor core, pumps, and heat exchangers are possible. The loop type of the left figure is similar to the thermal reactor system, whereas in the pull type of the right figure, all the components are immersed in a tank of liquid sodium. There are advantages and disadvantages to each concept, but both are practical. For instance, the pool design boasts greater heat capacity due to the larger sodium mass, whereas the loop configuration reduces the neutron shielding needed to avoid secondary sodium activation. Deployment of breeder reactors demands recycling of the plutonium. This is in turn requires reprocessing which involves the physical and the chemical treatment of irradiated fuel to separate uranium, plutonium, and fission products. From this left figure, we can see that the loop system is similar to the pressurized water reactor. The coolant, sodium coolant, flows through the core and removes the heat. Then that heat is rejected inside this heat exchanger where the secondary sodium coolant will pick up the heat and is used to produce the steam in another heat exchanger. But for the pool system, we are going to place this intermediate heat exchanger and the pumps inside this very big tank of sodium. That is the difference between the loop system and the pool system. 
from the standpoint of efficient use of uranium to produce power, it is clearly preferable to use a breeder reactor instead of a converter reactor. The breeder has the ability to use nearly all the uranium rather than a few percent because we can also use uranium-238, not just the uranium-235. It is impact, its impact can be viewed in two different ways. First, the demand for natural uranium would be reduced by a factor of approximately 30, cutting down on fuel cost while reducing the environmental effect of uranium mining. Second, the supply of fuel would last longer by a factor of 30. For example, instead of a mere 80 years for use of inexpensive fuel, we would have 2400 years. It is less clear, however, as to when a well-tested version of the breeder would actually be needed. A simplistic answer is when uranium gets very expensive. Such a situation is not imminent because there has been an oversupply of uranium for a number of years. And our analysis shows that breeders are more expensive to build and operate than converters. A reversal in trend is not expected until sometime well into the 21st century. The urgency to develop a commercial breeder has lessened as a result of slower adoption of nuclear power than anticipated. With the smaller rate of depletion of resources. Another key factor is the availability in the United States and the former USSR of large quantities of surplus weapon plutonium. Those weapon plutonium can be used as fuel in the form of MOX fuel. Chapter 26 Fusion Reactors a device that permits the controlled release of fusion energy is designated as a fusion reactor. The potentially available energy from the fusion process is enormous. The possibility of achieving controlled thermonuclear power on a practical basis has not yet been demonstrated. The main nuclear reactions that combine light isotopes to release energy are the deuterium, deuterium, deuterium tritium, and the deuterium helium-3 reactions. There are advantages and disadvantages of each. The reaction involving only deuterium uses abundant natural fuel available from water by isotope separation. It means that for the deuterium-deuterium reaction, they are abundant of fuel on Earth. However, the energy yield from the two equally likely reactions are low compared to other two reactions. In addition, the reaction rate as a function of particle energy is lower for the DD case than for the DT case. The reactivity sigma times V depends on cross-section and the particle speed is a more meaningful variable than the cross-section alone to represent the reaction rate. This figure shows the reaction rate for the fusion reactions. The x-axis is the temperature of the plasma and the y-axis is the reactivity. You will see that uh, the DT reaction is highest, while the DD reaction is relatively low. It means that uh, it will be much easier to make the reaction happen for the DT reaction compared to the DD reaction because the y-axis is the log scale. The DD reaction is shown here. So we have a hydrogen 2 hit another hydrogen 2. We will have two outcomes. This two outcome will have an equal possibility, so 50% chance for the first equation and 50% chance for the second equation. For one equation, it will produce a proton and also a tritium. And for the second equation, it will produce a neutron and a helium-3. For the DT reaction, it yields a helium ion and a neutron with the following energies. The equation is shown here. 
So we have a deuterium heat. Another tritium will produce the helium-4, whose energy is 3.5 MeV, and uh, a neutron, whose energy is 14.1 MeV. The DT cross-section is large, and the energy yield is favorable. The ideal ignition temperature for the DT reaction is only 4.3 keV, in contrast with 48 keV for the DT reaction, making the achievement of particle fusion with the former far easier. There is one drawback, however. It is that the artificial isotope tritium is required, so tritium does not naturally exist on Earth. It must be produced. Tritium can be generated by neutron absorption in, in lithium according to the following two reactions. We may have lithium-6 or lithium-7, and uh, lithium-6 absorb one neutron will produce the tritium and uh, helium, and it will produce 4.5 MeV. For the lithium-7, which is more common in the nature, absorb one neutron will produce a tritium and uh, an alpha particle and a neutron. This uh, reaction will absorb 2.5 MeV. The neutron can come from the DT fusion process itself in a breeding cycle, similar to that in fission reactors. Liquid lithium can thus be used concurrently as a coolant and a breeding blanket. The fact that the DT reaction gives the neutron as a byproduct is a partial disadvantage in a fusion machine, while materials are readily damaged by bombardment by 14.1 MeV neutrons, requiring frequent wall replacement. Also, materials of construction become radioactive as a result of neutron capture. These are engineering and operating difficulties, whereas the achievement of high enough energy to use neutron-free reactions would be a major scientific challenge. In the end, use of the DT reaction is limited by the availability of lithium, which is not as abundant as deuterium. All things considered, the DT fusion reactor is the most likely to be operated first, and its success may lead to the development of a DD reactor. Two methods involving machines have evolved. One consists of heating to ignition a plasma that is held together by electronic and magnetic force. This is the Magnetic Confinement Fusion Method, MCF. The other consists of bombarding pellets of fuel with laser beams or charged particle beams to compress and heat the material to ignition. This is called the inertial confinement fusion, ICF method. Certain conditions must be met for each of these approaches to be considered successful. The first condition is the achievement of the ideal ignition temperature, 4.3 keV for the DT reaction. It means that the particle has to be accelerated to high speed. The second condition involves the fusion fuel particle number density n and uh, a confinement time for the reaction top. This is called the Lawson criterion and it is usually expressed by this uh, formula. n tau is larger than those numbers for different reactions. It means that within, within a certain unit, unit volume, you need to have a certain number of fuel particles means that the fuel density has to be high enough. On the other side, those fuel, those fuel particle has to stay there for a certain period of time, that is the n and the times the top. We want this both number to be higher in order to trigger those fusion reactions. For the magnetic confinement machines, you may heard the name of tokamak. Now, you know it is a method of confinement machine for fusion. 
It is a donut-shaped torus. It generates a strong magnetic field to confine the plasma. The plasmas of MCF machines must be heated to reach the necessary high temperature. Various methods have been devised to supply the thermal energy. The first method used by the Togmark is resistance heating. A changing current in the coils surrounding the torus induces a current in the plasma. The second method of heating is neutral particle injection. The sequence of events is as follows. First, a gas composed of hydrogen isotopes is ionized by an electron stream. <clears throat> Second, the ions of hydrogen and deuterium produced in the source are accelerated to high speed through a vacuum chamber by a voltage of approximately 100 kV. Third, the ions pass through deuterium gas and by charge exchange are converted into direct, <coughs> directed neutral atoms. And four, the residual slow ions are drawn off magnetically, whereas the neutralized ion cross the magnetic field lines freely to deliver energy to the plasma. The third method uses microwaves in a manner similar to their application to cooking. The energy supply is a radio frequency generator. It is connected by a transmission line to an antenna next to the plasma chamber. The waves enter the chamber and die out there, delivering energy to the charts. If the frequency is right, resonant coupling to natural circular motion of electrons or ions can be achieved. This figure shows uh, a typical design of, the, of a magnetic confinement machine. Stability of the plasma is not sufficient to assure a practical fusion reactor because of various materials engineering problems. The lining of the vacuum chamber containing the plasma is subjected to radiation damage by the 14 MeV neutrons from the DT reaction. Also, when the plasma is disrupted, the electron forces cause runaway electrons to bombard the chamber wall, generating a large amount of heat. Materials will be selected to minimize the effect effects on what are called plasma facing components and reduce the replacement frequency. An example is a graphite fiber composite similar to those that were used to protect the surface of the space shuttle on re-entry. Other possible wall materials are silicon carbide, beryllium, tungsten, and zirconium, with the later metals possibly enriched in an isotope that does not absorb neutrons. Some self-protection of the chamber lining is provided by vaporization of materials with energy absorbed by a vapor shield. A number of tokamaks have been built at research facilities around the world. Some examples include the tokamak fusion test reactor at Princeton, now shut down, which achieved a very high plasma temperature. B. The joint European Taurus JET in England. It is a cooperative venture of several countries that has used the DT reaction. The red figure shows the interior of JET with the present inside to provide a scale. C. The Japan Taurus 60 used to study plasma physics. D. The D3D of General Atomic in San Diego is a modification of double at 3. It involves science studies of turbulence, stability, and interactions, along with the role of the diverter, a magnetic method of removing debris from a fusion reaction. C. 
the Alcatel C mod of the MIT, a compact machine with high general performance that shut down in 2016. Another approach to practical fusion is ICF, inertial confinement machines. It uses very small pellets of deuterium and tritium mixture as high density gas or as S. The pellet are heated by laser by laser light or by high speed particles. They act as miniature hydrogen bombs exploding and delivering the energy to a wall and a cooling media. This figure shows a quarter coin with some of the spheres. Their diameter is approximately 0.3 mm. To cause the thermonuclear reaction, a large number of beams of laser light or ions are trained on a pellet from different directions. A pulse of energy of the order of a nanosecond is delivered by what is called the diverter. The energy released in the series of micro explosion is expected to be deposited in a layer of liquid such as lithium that is continuously circulated over the surface of the container and out to a heat exchanger. This isolation of the reaction from metal walls is expected to reduce the amount of material damage. Other candidate wall protection protectors are liquid lead and uh, FLIBE, that is uh, fluoride lithium berlin. It is a molten salt. It uh, may not be necessary to replace the walls frequently or to install special resistant coating. This figure shows a schematic arrangement of a laser fusion reactor. reactor. Research on ICF is carried out at several locations in the United States, including first, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory operated NOVA from 1985 to 1999. This figure shows the interior of this facility. Second, the University of Rochester's Laboratory for Laser Energetic operates the facility Omega, which has had an impressive success. success. Also, the effect on SAF of magnetic field is being studied. Number three, Sandia National Laboratory first demonstrated with its particle beam fusion accelerator that the targets could be fitted with a proton beam. Of the approximately 100 fusion reactions with light isotopes, some do not involve neutrons. If a neutron-free reaction could be harnessed, the problems of maintenance of activated equipment and the disposal of radioactive waste could be eliminated. One example is the proton bombardment of the abundant boron isotope according to this equation. In this equation, we have a proton hit the boron produce 3 helium and energy. Because the Z is equal to 5 for boron, the electrostatic repulsion of the reactant is 5 times as great as for the DT reaction, resulting in a much lower cross-section. The temperature of the medium would have to be quite high. On the other hand, the elements are abundant and the boron-11 isotope is the dominant one in boron. Another neutron-free reaction uses the rare isotope helium-3. The deuterium helium-3 electrostatic force is twice as great as the deuterium tritium force, but because the products of the reaction are both charged, energy, recover, energy recovery would be more favorable. 
the process may be operated in such a way that a neutron from the DD reaction could be minimized. This would reduce neutron bombardment to the vacuum chamber walls. A deuterium helium-3 fusion reactor could use a permanent first wall, avoiding, avoiding the need for frequent replacement and at the same time reducing greatly the radioactive waste production by neutron activation. The principal difficulty with the use of the deuterium helium-3 reaction is the scarcity of helium-3. One source is the time sphere, but the helium is present only to 5 ppm by volume of air, and the helium-3 content is only 2 atoms per million of helium. Neutron bombardment of deuterium in a reactor is a preferable source. The decay of tritium in nuclear weapon could be a source of a few kilograms per year, but not enough to sustain an electrical power grid. Extra terrestrial source are especially abundant, but of course difficult to tap. Studies of moon Studies of moon rocks indicate that the lunar surface has a high helium-3 content as the result of bombardment by solar wind. Its helium-3 concentration is 140 ppm in helium. It has been proposed that mining, refining, and isotope separation process could be set up on the moon with spacecraft trans transfer of equipment and product. In the minds of many people, there is no distinction between reactors and bombs, resulting in an inordinate fear of nuclear power. Others believe that the development of commercial nuclear power in countries abroad will lead to their achievement of nuclear weapon capability. Because of these opinions, some even favor dismantling the domestic nuclear industry and uh, prohibiting U.S. commercial participation abroad. There are some connections between the reactor and the weapon. Plutonium production reactor <coughs> supply material for nuclear weapon. The first atomic bomb tested in New Mexico and the atomic bomb dropped in Nagasaki, Japan were produced in this way. Isotope separation production facilities supply highly enriched uranium for nuclear weapon if we use enough separation states. The so spent fuel in a reactor contains a great deal of uranium-238 as well as some uranium-235, plutonium-239, plutonium-240, and 241, along with fission products. If this reactor grade plutonium is chemically separated and uh, made into a weapon, the presence of neutrons from the spontaneous fission of plutonium-240 will encourage premature detonation and, uh, an, and uh, an inefficient explosion. For this reason, high burn up spent fuel is a poor source of bomb material. A much more likely avenue to obtain weapon-grade plutonium is the dedicated research reactor with low levels of neutron exposure to prevent plutonium-240 build-up. The nuclear fuel cycle utilizes technological approaches that can be employed similarly to produce nuclear weapon materials. Enrichment facilities may be configured to produce uranium-235 enrichments of greater than 5%, and the purified plutonium could be diverted during the reprocessing step. First, we note that two types of devices have been used. First is the fission explosive atomic bomb. It uses plutonium or highly enriched uranium. 
The second one is fusion or thermonuclear explosive, or we can also call it hydrogen bomb. The reaction described in earlier chapter are involved. Next, we will talk about the fission explosive. It is possible to create it is possible to create an explosive fission chain reaction by two different procedures, either by the gun technique or by implosion. This figure simplifies the gun system in which a plug of highly enriched uranium is fired into a cylinder of uranium to produce a supercritical mass. The uranium-235 bullet is fired from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Together, they will make a supercritical material. A tamper holds the combined material together momentarily. The first gun-type atomic bomb, given the name Little Boy, was about 10.5 feet, feet long and 2.4 feet in diameter and uh, weighted 9700 pounds. The gun technique is not feasible for a weapon that uses plutonium. Spontaneous fission of plutonium-240 would release neutrons that would trigger a premature, ineffective explosion. This figure shows the alternative the implosion method, in which chemical high explosive, chemical high explosive in the form of lens comprise a plutonium metal sphere to supercriticality. A temper of heavy metal is used. The first version of this weapon type used in war was called Fat Man. In either of these devices, an initial supply of neutron is required. One possibility is the polonium beryllium source with the alpha n reaction, alpha neutron reaction. So polonium 210 will decay into lead 206 plus alpha particle. Then the alpha particle will be absorbed by the beryllium 9 and produce the carbon and the neutron as the neutron source. The excess reactivity of the supercritical masses cause a rapid increase in power and the accumulated energy blows the material apart, a process labeled disassembly. In the case of implosion, when the phase material is compressed, there is an increase in ratio of surface to volume that results in large neutron leakage but a decrease in mean free pass that reduces leakage. The later effect dominates, giving a net positive increase of multiplication. An unreflected spherical plutonium assembly has a critical mass of approximately 16 kg, whereas that of a highly enriched uranium sphere is approximately 49 kg. By adding a 1-inch layer of natural uranium as a reflector, the critical masses drop to 10 kg and 31 kg, respectively. A thermonuclear weapon, a hydrogen bomb, is a nuclear weapon that uses the energy from a primary nuclear fission reaction to compress and ignite a secondary nuclear fusion reaction. Details of the compact and versatile modern thermonuclear weapons are not available, but we can describe the process involved in the first hydrogen bomb explosion, the IV Mac shot in the Swartz Pacific in 1952. It included heavy hydrogen as fusion fuel involving the two reactions also to be used in fusion reactors. The two reactions are shown here. We use the deuterium and deuterium reaction. It will produce tritium and uh, proton or helium-3 and a neutron. It may also use the deuterium and the tritium reaction, and it will produce the helium-4 and a neutron. 
As shown in this figure, the unit called sausage was a hollow steel cylinder, 20 feet long and 6 feet diameter. The cavity was lined with lead. At one end of the cavity was a primary sphere of plutonium and enriched uranium that would be caused to fission by implosion. In the middle of the cavity was a cylindrical container of liquid deuterium, much like a large thermal bottle. Along its axis was a stick of plutonium called the spark plug, which served as a secondary fission source. The deuterium container was surrounded by a natural uranium pusher. Finally, the inside of the casing was aligned with polyethylene. The sequence of events was as follows. As shown by figure B, an electrical discharge to to the detonator set off the high explosive shell of the primary. A uranium tamper and uh, shell vaporized and compressed the central plutonium ball while setting off a polyam beryllium source inside, releasing neutrons. As shown, by the, as shown in the figure C, X rays from the resulting supercritical fireball heated the polyethylene to a plasma that radiate X ray to heat the uranium pusher. Then go to figure D. Neutrons and the energetic alpha particle were released in the heated deuterium and the fission took place in the spark plug. Then go to figure E. Some tritium was formed which contributed to the fusion reaction. Additional energy and radiation came from fast neutron fission in the uranium-238 in the temper. The resultant explosion created a crater 200 feet deep and uh, one mile across. In later weapon versions, the fusion components was composed of lithium deuteride. Neutrons from fission interact with the lithium-6 according to this equation. So neutron is absorbed by the lithium-6 to produce the tritium and the helium-4. The tritium produced allows for the deuterium tritium reaction to occur. Other thermonuclear devices use the tritium as the principal explosive material. To increase the yield from the primary, a technique called boosting may be employed to inject a deuterium tritium gas mixture. Now we move to the next section to discuss the nuclear weapon effects. The nuclear explosive release the energy in several ways. First, there is the blast effect, which is shockwave. Second is the thermal radiation from the heated surrounding material at a temperature of typically 6,000 Celsius, temperature similar to the surface of the sun. Finally, there is the re nuclear radiation, consisting mainly of neutrons and gamma rays. The approximate distribution of the energy that goes into these three modes are respect respectively 50% for the shock wave, 35%, for the thermal radiation and 15% for the, for the nuclear radiation. This is based on the air burst of a fission weapon at an altitude below 40,000 feet. The nuclear device yield is based upon the initial energy release. The energy yield of a weapon is measured in equivalent tons of chemical explosive. By convention, one ton of TNT, one metric ton of TNT, corresponds to 10 to 9 calories of energy. In joule, that is 4.184 times 10 to 9 joule. So let's look at an example. We'd like to determine the net number of neutrons and the gammas emitted from a nuclear device with a 
10 kiloton yield. Because the yield is based on prompt energy release of 180 MeV fission, and this 180 MeV per fission excludes the decay energy from the decay gamma, decay beta, and the neutrino energy. So the prompt energy release is 180 MeV per fission. Then the detonation of this uranium-235 will require this number of fissions. In the numerator, we have the yield. We convert the yield to joule, so 10 kiloton, so that is 10 to 4 tons, metric tons, then times 4.184 times 10 to 9 joule for 1 ton of TNT. Then we divide the number of energy, the, uh, the number of joules released per fission. That is 180 MeV, then we convert it to joule. So 180 MeV, then times 1.6 times 10 to negative 13 joule per MeV. So we have the total energy release over the energy release per fission. So we get the number of fissions needed. Each fission will release mu neutrons for uranium-235, this number is roughly 2.4. So one of these neutrons is uh, required to promote the chain reaction. So it will release 1.4 neutrons per fission to the surrounding. Also, about 7 1 MeV prompt gamma ray are released per fission event. The use of weapons of mass destruction inflicts a substantial human toll, as shown in this table. And this table shows the summary of the two fission bombs used in the World War II dropped in Japan. Casualties are due to thermal burn, mechanical blast, and ionization radiation effects. Roughly half the Japanese fatality were due to burn as seen in this figure. Dark-colored uh, fabric tended to transmit the thermal radiation, whereas light-colored clothing provided a degree of protection by reflection of the radiation heat. The immediate radiation effect of a nuclear explosion is extremely severe at a distance up to a few kilometers. In addition to the initial X-rays, gamma rays, and neutrons, there is a great deal of radioactive fallout, contamination, residual radiation from fission products and neutron-induced activation products. Besides the early casualties, ionizing radiation has the potential to cause both deterministic and stochastic long-term effects. The late effects include cataracts, leukemia, and other cancers. During the Manhattan Project, weapon-grade, highly enriched uranium was given the code name Auralloy, a shortened version of Arc-Rich alloy, after the location of the plants where the uranium was enriched. The term Auralloy is still occasionally used to refer to enriched uranium. One program called Megatons to Megawatts allows the U.S. to purchase Russian's highly enriched uranium from dismantled nuclear weapon to be converted by blending into low-enriched uranium for use in power reactors. Such program mutually reduces the nuclear warhead owned by the two supernations. So let's look at one example. Consider the dump blending dump blending of 10 tons of alloys. So we have 93 weight percent. With 0.2 weight percent uranium enrichment tail to form 5 weight percent reactor grade uranium. <clears throat> we can in determine the input tails needed and output product masses using a material balance similar to that of the previous section. The HU highly enriched uranium MO and the tails MT masses must equal to the product mass. 
So we have the mass of the overloy plus the tail of the 0.2 weight percentage is equal to the mass of the product whose weight percentage is 5%. And uh, similarly, we also have the uranium-235 input and output masses are equivalent. So we have the net 235 of the from the alloy plus the net 235 from the tail is equal to the net 235 weight for the product that is 5%. Here the x is the mass fraction of the 235 in the particular material flow. Then solving these two equations. In these two equations, we have two unknowns. One is the MP. Another one is the MT, okay, M product and M tail. Then by solving these two equations, we can obtain the we can obtain the result. So as shown here, we substitute all the other numerical values into these equations. Then we have just the two unknowns, MP and MT. Solving these uh, two equations reveals that the MT and MP uh, 183 and 193 tons, respectively. Therefore, a significant amount of reactor fuel can be manufactured from down blending of weapons grade material. This concludes the new knowledge of this course. Thanks for watching.